was raised, even death could not contain him. We are saved, Satan's bow he overcame. No more shame, no more guilt and condemnation. Friends, welcome to Log On at 11, Spurgeon Baptist Church's online presence during this COVID season. Happy Easter. Uh, it's lovely to have you with us today. Uh, we're going to do what we've been doing. It's, it's become our normal practice now. Um, we just use a little liturgy to hold worship together. Uh, if you've got a print copy in front of you, everything in bold type is what we say together. Everything in light type, I say on my own. Uh, if you're following on the screen, everything in yellow type is what we say together. Now, as the service unfolds, there are a couple of extra things uh, that we're including today. There are two short video clips, uh, and they will bookend the sermon and they focus on Peter's experience. Um, the first one just is, is a very powerful little piece around what Peter might have been thinking as he reflected on the fact that he had denied Jesus uh, on Good Friday. Uh, and the second piece, which will come at the, <coughs> excuse me at the end of the sermon, uh, that's Peter reflecting. On his restoration. Uh, so you, just a couple of extra bits added in uh, and of course there's communion as well today because it's Easter. So let's begin. In the beginning, before time, before people, before the world began, God was. 
here and now, among us, beside us, enlisting the people of the earth for the purposes of heaven, God is. In the future, when we will have turned to dust and all we know has found its fulfilment, God will be. Let us pray. Loving God, you are faithful, just and forgiving. Help us now to grasp the greatness of your love. Where we have failed to love and loved to hurt, forgive us and heal us. Where we have scorned difference and have been indifferent to those in need, forgive us and heal us. Where we have spoken harsh words to others and have been quick to take offence ourselves, forgive us and heal us. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. What will we arrest him for? We'll find something. <laughs> oh. I heard him say he was going to kill the Emperor! He uses dark magic to win over Simpleton! He said he would tear down God's temple and build it again in three days! Don't you have an answer to what these men are testifying against you? Tell us! Are you the Messiah, the Son of God? Yes, I am. Soon you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right side of God, all-powerful, and coming on the clouds of heaven. <laughs> this man claims to be God. We don't need any more witnesses. You've heard what he said. What do you think? He, he is guilty, guilty and deserves to die. die. It can't be! You? You're a friend of his, aren't you? You were with him. I don't know what you mean. But you were. This man was with Jesus. I don't even know the man. You are one of them. You can tell by your accent. I'm not lying. I don't know him. My God! My God! Why have you deserted me?
special guest called Minty. She might be a bit nervous, so please do make her feel welcome. <laughs> oh, hi, Luke. Good to see you. Hi, everyone. Oh, you're not nervous at all, are you? You seem to be very jumpy this morning. I'm very happy. Why so happy? It's springtime. Oh, I see. Yes, it's a very busy time for us lambs raising our profile by at least 87 percent. I bet. So, what sorts of things are you up to these days? Oh well, mainly skipping in the fields, eating grass, with a bit of posing by the daffodils when I get the chance. Busy life then. Oh yes, you wouldn't believe how many people stop and watch us and say ah or cute or Mmm, delicious. What? Nothing. It's not easy being this gorgeous, you know. Actually, talking about springtime, do you know what is so special about today? Mmm, Sunday? Yes, that's right. But not just any Sunday. Is it the Sunday that you have your annual bath? No, don't be cheeky. That's not till next month. No, um, anyway. This is the Sunday we remember all that Jesus has done for us, going to the cross, dying and rising to life again. It's Easter Sunday. Oh, Jesus is amazing, isn't he? He sure is. Hey, did you know Jesus is so amazing? He has lots of different names. Really? What, like Steve? No. Arthur? No. Tony? No. Bruce? No. Frank? No, stop it. I mean names that tell us how wonderful he is, like Prince of Peace, First and Last, King of Kings. Oh, I see what you mean. Well, actually, my mum told me she said, Jesus is the Lamb of God. And what do you think that means? Is he cute like me? Well, no, not really. You see, in Jesus' time and way before that, they used to, uh, well... There's no easy way to say this, but a lamb was killed to take the punishment instead of the person who had done wrong. That's horrific, especially if you're a lamb. Jesus put an end to all that. So he was killed instead of all the lambs? Exactly. He knew that he was going to the cross to die, and he did it for us, to be our sacrifice, to take our place, because he was the only one perfect enough to take all the things we have done wrong and make it right with God. So, because he was the perfect lamb, 
It never needed to be done again. Yes, that means no more sacrificing lambs at the temple. Jesus paid the price. That sounds like good news for everyone, especially for us lambs. It is, and we should share it with everyone we meet. Jesus is the Lamb of God who died for us. No way! Yes way, and that's not all. Three days after his death, Jesus came back to life. The tomb in which he laid was empty. He appeared to many people, showing them that he had defeated death once and for all. Amazing! That really deserves a celebration! Yep, so this Easter, the most important lambs are not the ones dancing in the fields, or even the ones on your dinner plate. We don't talk about that very much, it tends to hurt our feelings. It was Jesus, the perfect lamb, who died for us and then rose again. Well, with all that in mind, I wish you all a very happy Easter. Thanks, Minty. Happy Easter to you too. Now, what do we say? Bye-bye. That's right. Bye-bye, everyone, and enjoy this very special Sunday. Luke 24, 1-12 Jesus has risen. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven others, to the eleven and all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. For they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen laying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. You're the Christ. He asked us who he said he was. That's what he said. You're the Christ. You know he rode a donkey into Jerusalem, right? People laying down a procession of palm leaves for the one we'd all been waiting for. It was like one of those pinch me moments. Then Passover came. Me and the boys are tucking into the flatbread and Jesus just comes out with it. One of you dipping bread in the balsamic's gonna turn me in, he said. Then he takes the bread, tears and shares it. What are you waiting for? Tuck in, he said. This is my body, broken, beaten, bruised, for you. Then he gives thanks and passes round the red. Drink up, he said. This is my blood, poured out for plenty. A bit later, we're up the Mount of Olives with Jesus. You know, when push comes to shove, you're all going to bail on me, he said. No chance, I said. The rest of them might. I'm not going anywhere, I said. Count on it, he said. Before the night's over, you'll swear blind you don't even know me, he said. On my life, I'll never deny you. I'll die for you, I said. It all happened so fast. One minute. We're with Jesus as he's praying up Gethsemane and we're sparked out unconscious the next. They've got Jesus in handcuffs. And all they can remember is what he said. That we'll bail on him. That we'll deny him. That I'll deny him. I'm not having it, I thought. He's got it wrong, I thought. So I drew out my sword. I gripped my teeth and I let rip. I cut this guy's ear clean off. Come on, let's have it. Enough, Jesus said. As he just goes quietly and I just legged it. I tailed him till we ended up at the chief priest's place. Me, in the courtyard, outside by the fire, him, inside, standing trial. 
trial. Witnesses fabricating fake news, trying to pin something on Jesus that would land a death penalty. You got nothing to say, they said. No defence, they said, go to him, give it to us straight. Are you the Christ, they said. I am, he said. Enough said, as the guards struck him, stripped him and spat on him. Bang! Go on! Prophesy who landed that right up, they said. Meantime, I'm warming my hands by the fire, trying to keep a low profile. Although there's only so much blending in you can do when you're watching your best mate and mentor get the living daylights kicked out of him. Hang about. I know you, the servant girl said. Must have one of those faces, I said. No, you're uh, one of his lot from Nazareth, she said. Don't know what you're talking about, love, I said. I made a beeline for the exit, but now she's got a captive audience. Hey, guess who he's friends with, she said. Thinks she's had a bit too much of the Merlot, I said, but they won't let it go. I could see them eyeballing me, working it out in their head. Come on, mate. If you're not from Galilee, I'll eat my own sandal on my mother's life. I've not even met the guy. The cockle crows a second time. And that's when I see him. Tossed around like a tear and share flatbread. Broken, beaten, bruised. Just like he said. And with a bottle's worth of red blood smeared across his face, he looks at me. He looks right at me, right into the depths of me. And all I can remember is what I said. I'll never deny you. I'll die for you. Three times you'll deny me, Pete, he said. And I just broke down and wept. <sighs> So, uh, Good Friday had been a terrible day, hadn't it, for the disciples. The worst day that the followers of Jesus had ever endured. They had such hopes and dreams all centred around Jesus. They had seen so much, hadn't they? They had heard so much from him and been part of so many exciting things as they travelled around with him. There was something altogether lovely about Jesus. He was such an attractive man, an attractive personality. So many wanted to be around him, wanted to draw near to him, wanted to touch him, to hear him, um, to be with him. He was altogether alive. It was stimulating to be in his presence. And when you were in his presence, you just knew that anything was possible. There was real hope around this man. And of course, he was a courageous man too, wasn't he? He was seemingly a man without fear, <clears throat> clearing the temple, uh, opposing religious authority figures, seeming to have a quite a revolutionary approach to religion. I mean, the question that seemed to be constantly in his head was what makes for human flourishing. Now, of course, you know, there were rules. There always are rules uh, when it comes to religion. Um, but his approach was entirely different. Uh, rules were OK, but they were there and, you know, only there really for supporting human beings and helping them find their way to God. They were not there as a burden. They were never supposed to be that and should never be used like that. And his preaching and teaching, they were absolutely amazing. Um, not for him, you know, you have heard Rabbi X say this and Rabbi Y say this and I say this. When he spoke, he said, I'm telling you what my father has given me to tell you. He spoke with real authority. Things happened. And what a great storyteller. 
ordinary things, things that you had experience of, things that you were very, very um, comfortable with and experienced in. And suddenly these things, well, they just opened a possibility that you never saw before. How many times had you watched a, a guy broadcasting seed, just throwing it everywhere? All the time. Every year. Saw it all the time. And suddenly, that's about whether or not you're ready to hear from God. And are you? You would just tickle your imagination with these things. Healing. People were brought who were sick and they were well when he talked to them or touched them or whatever it was. Authority over demons. Be quiet. Come out of him. And they did. What an amazing man. Things happened around Jesus all the time, didn't they? Really good things. And now it's all gone. He'd been taken away. Jesus. He's dead. And they had seen it. The women had watched from a distance, yes, but they had been there and they watched him die. They saw him taken down from the cross. They saw his body laid in the tomb. They knew he was dead. And on the Sunday, they come prepared to offer those last offices of love to their Lord. They've come to embalm the body. They come expecting a dead Jesus and are met with a stunning question. Why do you look for the living among the dead? They come expecting death and are confronted with life and it is entirely disorientating to them. There's absolutely no expectation of resurrection amongst these followers of Jesus, despite Jesus's teachings, despite his repeated explanations. The women arrive with spices. They're ready to embalm a body. The expectation is death, not life. It is clear from all the gospel accounts that everyone thought that Jesus was dead. It is very, very important to grasp this. The gospel accounts were not manufactured by the early church to spread a story about a resurrected Jesus that was untrue. The first disciples did not believe it to begin with. On the first Easter Sunday morning, they did not get it. They start to get it when they start to meet the risen Jesus. And there are examples of that uh, in the Gospels and beyond. The Emmaus uh, Road, for example, uh, which we'll look at when I come back from my leave. Um, it, it is an absolute surprise that Jesus has risen from the dead. There is no body. This is the surprise. The women find the stone rolled away from the entrance to the tomb and no body. What has happened here? And while they're wondering about this, two men appear in clothes that gleam like lightning. Uh, and we're taken, aren't we, to that other place where clothing gleamed like lightning. The Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus is so transformed uh, by being in the presence of the Father. Um, these two men are angels, they're angelic uh, messengers. Once again, we are in the presence of heaven. This is a thin place where the presence of heaven is pressing in to our world. It breaks into earthly experience and the women are afraid. And the question comes, why do you look for the living among the dead? The explanation, he is not here. He has risen. Remember what he said to you when he was with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified and on the third day be raised again. Remember what he told you. Why do you look for the living among the dead? 
we human beings do this all the time, don't we? We search for meaning, we search for life, uh, for purpose, shape to life in all sorts of places, you know, money or drink or drugs or relationships, power, work, celebrity or fame, family, even religion, even that gets pressed into service. Um, why do you look for the living among the dead? Real life is not to be found in those things. It's found somewhere else. Um, there is unbelief amongst these first followers of Jesus. The women remember what Jesus said and they go back to the eleven and all the others and they tell them. And the women are named. That is very important. It means that those early Christian disciples are able to check the source of the information if they want to. These gospel accounts were written down um, before the first generation of believers had all died out. So if you wanted to check facts, you could. And of course, when the stories are being told, uh, if you were there and you knew that was maybe not quite right, you were able to say, well, my recollection is, and you were able to thrash out between you what actually happened. Uh, so these women are actually named. Uh, and women actually are very significant in the gospel accounts. Uh, they're not they're not raised up with great fanfare, many of them, but they are a constant presence in the life of Jesus. They're there all the time. Because of all that we were saying earlier, you know, such an attractive man, uh, a man that treated women with respect, that treated women as human beings, as equals, not as uh, disposable or adornment but real, significant human beings that deserved proper attention and, and deserved to be listened to uh, and to be a part of what he was doing in the world. The first will be last and the last will be first. So, the, the, and let's just underline all of this, um, women. The first person to know that Jesus was coming into the world was a woman. Mary, his mother, <laughs> uh, the first person to be given a glimpse of God's plan of salvation, Mary, his mother, the first people to know that Jesus had been raised from the dead, these women. Um, this is important because women in those days were regarded as less than men. And although things are better in our culture, there's still an awful lot that needs to be done. And you don't have to go far, uh, really, do you? Uh, to know that that's the case, just thinking about what's in the news in these days. Uh, everyone welcome. The Me Too movement from a year or two back. Everyone welcome now. Stories of, you know, young women and girls in schools uh, being harassed sexually, um, sometimes physically, sometimes verbally, but harassed and bullied nonetheless. We've got such a lot of work to do still to make sure that we have a Christ-like approach to our sisters in Christ. And it is incumbent upon us, brothers, uh, to change the way that we think, to change the way that we behave, to make sure that we make safe spaces for our sisters to make sure that their gift and talent is acknowledged and employed, deployed in the life of the church and beyond. Work for us to do. Always keep in front of you, gents, the way that Jesus operated. Let him be your guide. If you're uncertain at any point, you know, you look to the Lord. Uh, and if you're in uh, conversation with someone if you are not sure whether you're being invited to take the relationship further just ask <laughs> don't assume anything
young men, older men, all men. So these women uh, in those days would have been regarded as less than men. Their testimony in a court was worth half what a man's testimony uh, would have been worth. Women and children were of less account than men. Uh, the message of Christianity is good news for all people everywhere. The resurrection is an amazing piece of news. Uh, and it is especially good news if you believe that you are of little or no account. And the women do what the angels ask them to do. They go back to the men and they share the news. We have seen the Lord. Uh, wrong. <clears throat> he's not there. He's risen. Uh, but the apostles, men, don't believe it. Not just because the messengers are women, but because this news makes no sense at all. And Peter gets up and runs to the tomb, as does John. And Peter sees that it's empty. He sees the grave clothes and he goes away wondering what has happened here. He's not yet a believer, but he is on the road. What about you? Well, you're accessing this service, so either you're doing this because well, as part of your annual routine, you normally would go to church or access a service somehow at this time of the year. And I'm glad you've come, if that's uh, the reason. So you're, you're at least aware of the Jesus story and you're at least aware of the significance and importance of this time of the year for Christian people. Um, so where are you now? Have you... Have you got to that place where you're like Peter, you're looking at the empty tomb <clears throat> and you're thinking to yourself, I wonder what this means. I wonder, I wonder if this means anything at all for me. I mean, there are all sorts of things that people say about the empty tomb. And if you've been around me for any length of time at all, you know that. I'm always interested in the stories that get told at this time of the year in the media, you know, about possible explanations for the empty tomb. Someone stole the body. Um, the authorities nicked the body. The disciples stole the body. Uh, he wasn't really dead. You know, he, he revived in the tomb. And you know, there are all sorts of things. When you look at those alternatives, when you look at them properly, actually, none of them really hold any water at all. The only real credible explanation for the empty tomb is that Jesus has risen from the dead, not just because the tomb is empty, but because he is seen alive by the disciples on numerous occasions. And they're very different occasions as well. Sometimes there's a big crowd. Sometimes there's a few. Um, sometimes there's only one. But there are there are a number of post-resurrection appearances that are recorded for us in the New Testament, uh, enough to support the view that Jesus actually did rise from the dead. Um, if he didn't rise from the dead, then I've got nothing to say. I've got no hope uh, and I may as well go and find something else to do. But I, I think that Jesus did rise. I think that's the only credible explanation. The conclusions actually that we come to in that place when we're looking at the empty tomb, the conclusions that we come to there will shape the journey for the rest of our lives. It certainly shaped the journey of my life uh, when I came to the conclusion that I came to. Everything changed uh, from that moment. Jesus says of himself, I've come that they might have life, life to the full, life in all its fullness. And he also says, I am the way, the truth and the life. So if you're looking for meaning, for purpose, for shape for your life, maybe it is to be found in this Jesus who was dead, but is now alive. He is not here. He has risen. Alleluia. Three pounds at the door, our hearts pounding out of our chest. They found a hiding spot. Get down! Shut up! We wait for the inevitable. 
Nothing. False alarm. Three more pounds at the door. Let me in quick, she said. We opened the door and bolted back shut. Mary, what are you doing? You're trying to get us killed, we said. He's, he's, he's gone, she said. What do you mean he's gone? I didn't stick around for the answer. I took the bolt off the door and I just bolted. Sprint into the tomb with a million thoughts sprinting through my head. John flies past and beats me there. I catch up and John's just standing there gobsmacked. The stone was rolled over. I stoop into the place where Jesus' lifeless body lay just hours before. And now it's empty. By the clothes he was buried in, folded up tidy. It was empty. We look at each other speechless. I mean, could it? Has he done the impossible? The R word? We couldn't even bring ourselves to say it. Or we just being played, I thought. Some kind of sick joke, some trap set by the Romans, rabbis, pilot, take your pick. We didn't hang around long enough to find out. We legged it back to the hiding spot. The others opened the door and bolted it back shut. And that's just before it happened. You know, the first time. Should have seen our faces. I jumped out of my skin. We told Thomas he wasn't buying it. Till a week later, it happened again. Should have seen his face. You'd think we'd known better a third time, right? After things settle down, we go back home to Galilee. So we're down Tiberia Sea, right? There's me, Nate, Tom, James, John, the Zebedee boys. It's pitch black. We're hundreds yards out, fishermen right in our sweet spot, trying to make a catch, thin and abysmally. Anyway, day's breaking and this randomer is wandering the shore. Any luck, boys, he said. Not a single sardine, we said. Try the other side of the boat, he said. So we cast our nets the other side of the boat and what do you know? So many fish, not even mat attacks could count them. It's him, said John. Well, what are we doing faffing about with all this fish, I thought. I dive straight in, splash, head down, swim to shore. I get there and he's lit up this barbie. How'd you get on with the catch? Any joy, he said. Bring him over here, plenty of room, he said. I look round and see the boys dragging out of the water what must have been the biggest catch I'd ever seen. Anyone for breakfast? He said. So there we were. Stuffing our faces with fish sarnies, just staring at him. We knew it was him. Well, no one dared ask. After breakfast, he asked me if I loved him three times. Yes, Lord, I said, as it brought to mind the three times I flat out denied him. Look after my sheep, he said. You got it, Lord, I said. He had, you know, done the impossible, risen. One time he asked us who he said he was. You're the Christ, I said. The anointed one, the one we'd all been waiting for, the hand-picked rescuer. Still, I didn't see it coming, nor the way it played out. But it was always part of the plan. He came to bear our brokenness to his breaking point. From fully perfect to fully broken to two days later fully fixed so we can be forever fixed in him. Like I said, He'd done the impossible, risen, and there's no denying it. That changes everything.
Let us pray. Father God, we lift before you all of our young people. It has been a real shock to hear the stories of young women and girls speaking of um, physical abuse in schools. We pray for all of our children and young people all, all across our country uh, and in our locality. We want everyone to be safe. We've, we're committed to that as a church. Uh, we have been for a number of years and it, it just makes us so sad to hear that school is not a safe place for girls and for young women. What are we teaching our boys? What are they picking up from us uh, in our families about what it means to be a man? What can we do, Lord? What should we do to help change the perceptions and the views of boys and young men about girls and young women? Help us out, Lord. We're very aware that there are difficulties uh, around race uh, in our country and indeed around the world. And the George Floyd trial is once again uh, focusing attention on all of that. As we've just been saying about girls and young women, so we say about black people, really, Lord, it's about helping us to see one another as real human beings, intrinsically valuable in and of ourselves, not because we can do something, not because we can make something, not because we're clever or beautiful, but just because we are human, human persons valuable in your sight. Lord, help us to see one another as you see us and help us to treat one another properly. We pray for the people of Hong Kong. China has changed Hong Kong's electoral rules in these last few days effectively banning any opposition parties from fielding uh, members of parliament, potentially, arresting some pro-democracy campaigners and candidates, and generally clamping down on any opposition. We pray for all those that are seeking a measure of democracy in that land. We pray that our own uh, nation, our own government, uh, will speak out clearly and firmly uh, in support uh, of those folk uh, and that we will continue uh, to speak to the authorities in Beijing about what they're doing. We continue to be grateful, Lord, for the uh, vaccine rollout in this country. Uh, we said last week uh, how grateful we were and we listed all of those people and organisations and really it's the same again. You know who they are. They know who they are. We know who they are. We are profoundly grateful, Lord, to each and every one. Uh, and today, uh, Easter Sunday, I want to pray for all of my friends who are still serving in the army, army chaplains, and others who are involved with the Defence Christian Network. Uh, this time of the year is uh, acknowledged uh, in the MOD as a significant time for Christians. And we're thankful, Lord, that that is the case. We pray for all those that uh, run the Defence Christian Network Pray that their influence uh, will continue to grow and expand and we pray your rich blessing upon them. We remember our friends and ask that you would be all that they need on this 
beautiful day. Chris, Ken, Adrian and Hugh, Eric, Les, Dot, Margaret and Bob, Colin and Jackie, Peter, Jesse, Dennis and Shirley, Mary, Jay, Terry, Lynn, Graham, Lauren and Lewis, Andy, Thelma, Naomi. We gather up all of our prayers as we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. We say the canticle together. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We come to share communion. Uh, the way we're going to do this is I'm going to read the words that I would normally read. When we're in church together, I will lead the prayers that I would normally lead. Uh, you'll need a piece of bread and you'll need a little wine or whatever you're substituting for wine. Uh, and we will eat and drink together. And I'll be very clear about when we do that and how we do that. You just follow what I am doing. So, if you truly and earnestly repent of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbours, and are resolved to lead a new life, following the commandments of God, and walking henceforth in his holy ways, then draw near with faith, and take this sacrament to your comfort and growth in grace. Come to this sacred table, not because you must, but because you may. Come not to testify that you are righteous, but that you sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ and desire to be his true disciples. Come not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Not because you have any claim on heaven's rewards, but because in your frailty and sin, you stand in constant need of heaven's mercy and help. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He also said, listen, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come into the house and eat with them and they with me. Let us pray. Lord, we come to your table trusting in your mercy and not in any goodness of our own. We are not worthy even to gather up the crumbs from under your table, but it is your nature always to have mercy and on that we depend. So feed us with the body and blood of Jesus Christ, your son, that we may forever live in him and he in us. Amen. This is what the Apostle Paul tells us concerning the institution of the Lord's Supper. For the tradition which I handed on to you came to me from the Lord himself, that on the night of his arrest the Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks to God he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Whenever you do this, remember me. In the same way he took the cup after supper, and said, This cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood. 
whenever you drink it, do this in memory of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. Jesus offered a prayer of thanksgiving for bread and for wine, and we shall do the same. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for bread and for wine, ordinary things, which in your hands become extraordinary. We thank you for giving us something physical to help us remember you. Uh, your body broken for us, the bread broken. Your blood shed for us, the wine that we can taste. Things to touch and see and taste. Thank you, Father, for putting these things into our hands. As we eat and drink, may we do so with thankful hearts. Amen. So after he'd given thanks, the Lord took the bread and he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. The body of Christ broken for us. In the same way, he took the cup after supper. This cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink this, remember me. The blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Bind me the glory, risen, conquering Son. Endless is the victory, thou death hast won. Angels in bright raiment, rolled the stone away. Kept the folded grave clothes, where thy body lay. Thy the glory, risen and conquering Son. Endless is the victory, thou death hast won. Lord Jesus meets us, risen from the with gladness hymns of triumph sing for the Lord now liveth death has lost his sting thy be the glory risen and conquering sun endless is the victory Great 
going to God's word with joy and peace and love and hope in your hearts. And the blessing of God Almighty, creator, redeemer and sustainer of all, be with us all evermore. Amen.